So we have come to the final session of the fourth South Asian Diaspora Convention, and the session titled South Asian Diaspora, a Strategic Asset. will be chaired by Professor Kisho Mahobani, Distinguished Fellow at Asia Research Institute, National University of Singapore. And Professor Mahobani will be joined by the following panelists. Mr. Mohammad Shahidu Haq, former Secretary Government of Bangladesh, Professor C. Raja Mohan, Director, Institute of South Asian Studies. Mr. Haq is a Foreign Secretary of Government of Bangladesh. So could we invite all of you on stage, please? It's a great privilege and honor to be uh, invited to, to, to moderate this discussion uh, on uh, South Asia diaspora strategic asset, question mark. But they don't ask whether it's an asset to the sending country or <laughs> the receiving country. <laughs> There's a certain degree of ambiguity there, which we, I'm sure we will explore. Uh, I also want to assure you that uh, I know, I, even though you're such a wonderful audience and you're staying on, I know that you're still exhausted. So we do plan to end on time. So don't worry about uh, that. Uh, and the, the subject we have chosen, of course, is a very challenging one. Uh, it's got so many dimensions. It's got the economic dimension, the impact of the diaspora, on the sending country, receiving country. There's a political dimension. Uh, it also, there's politics that come from the sending country and also from the receiving country. Even in Singapore, there's been some politics on the diaspora, as you all know. And then there's also the social ethical dimension. Uh, whenever people cross borders, obviously it affects their lives and we have to also discuss that dimension. But we are very fortunate that we do have uh, truly uh, a very distinguished panel. I mean that quite seriously because uh, the one thing I have in common with uh, Muhammad Shahid Shahidul Haq is that he's foreign secretary in Bangladesh. And I know how important that job is because I used to be a foreign secretary myself <laughs> uh, many years ago. But what's interesting about Shahidul is that you know, you, you've actually spent a lot of time with the International Organization of Migration. I think you were there for, from what I can see here, 11 years, and you also serve as director there. So uh, you, are, you are truly the expert on, uh, uh, on this subject. Uh, and of course, on my left is someone really doesn't need any introduction because he's the one who organized this conference, <laughs> uh, Raja Mohan. But you all know that he's a very, very distinguished a uh, scholar, he's published uh, a lot of books. I, I'm so envious of him. And I, someday I hope to catch up with you, Raja. <laughs> but with that very brief uh, introduction, uh, both the speakers have agreed to speak for about five minutes or so, uh, make a few points, and then I hope that uh, we'll have a brief discussion on the stage before we uh, throw the floor open to uh, all of you. So, Shahidul, if you don't mind, would you mind starting now? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, where to start? I'll start off um, with an assumption. Uh, we are today focusing on diaspora, but diaspora is part of uh, global migration debate or controversy. Uh, recently, as you know, from 2015 onwards, migration has become a bad word. Yeah? Not everywhere, but in many places. And centering around that, there's a lot of debates, whether it's good or bad, as we know, they start off in 60s and 70s, uh, we thought migration contributes to uh, development both of individuals who migrate and also destination and origin countries. But then gradually things uh, went wrong uh, and a million people started walking, uh, crossing the European border and people thought uh, uh, the state system is uh, altogether crumbling uh, under the pressure of a, a movement of people. So that was the time when uh, migration became a bad word uh, in somehow or other uh, a lot of uh, controversies. Now within that debate, I think we need to put the diaspora debate. Diaspora is a, a kind of a peripheral to the whole migration debate, but somehow it is linked, and I'll tell you what, why it is linked. Uh, diaspora uh, as a concept, uh, it is also not a, a positive connotation, used to be as we all know, uh, because of, uh, of the global uh, uh, ethnic politics. But there were two 
uh, school of thoughts. One, it says that migration is an asset, which is the focus of today. But there's also another school of thought which suggests that uh, uh, migration is a loss. Uh, migration even uh, is uh, a, a diaspora is a loss, and diaspora is also a risky affair. Uh, you know, there are diasporas who stood up uh, for various uh, 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 democratic movements and, and civil unrest and all kinds of things. So that's there, although it's currently not being uh, brought to focus uh, uh, as we know. But let's look at the migration as an asset, uh, di diaspora as an asset. Now, the first question is, are diaspora migrants or not? That debate continued for 60s and 70s and 80s as of today, and then it died down. At one stage, we thought, uh, uh, let's not have that debate anymore. It's not a number game. It is not a category game. It's not a definitional game. It's a, it's a phenomena to see whether it contributes uh, to, the, uh, to the home and host uh, and to the individual or not. And we decided that, we means the migration world decided that they will treat migrants and diaspora as, as synonym. So having that uh, assumption uh, cleared, uh, I think uh, my, uh, diaspora contributes in primarily through three different uh, uh, ways. One is that the whole issue of financial contribution to both home and host country. You, know, you, ca you can't only contribute to your home country without doing the same with the host country because you're living there and you're every day working uh, and making a contribution. The other one is the whole issue of, um, uh, no, it's not only financial issue, it's not only remittance, but also the whole issue of uh, creating a network through which the diaspora transfer knowledge. Both in the home country, from home country, the host country, and host country, the home country. It's not a one-way process. A and the a last one, uh, which is very important, the diaspora also played a very important role in the global geopolitics, uh, which I'm sure Professor uh, will, will, will focus. So in many ways, this is extremely critical and important factor. And, uh, Coming back to the number, what is the total number of diaspora? It's very difficult to actually uh, uh, sort of come to a definite uh, figure, but uh, you know, if, as far as the South Asia is concerned, uh, today it was quoted 41 million, I suppose. Now, whether the uh, uh, people who are in the lower end of the scale are they included in that category or not, that's a question. Uh, in the migration world, we think that despite the skill level, all are diaspora as long as they continue to believe and wants to keep a contact with their homeland. That's all. That's the, that is the minimum uh, uh, requirement that's needed, that whatever you do when you are out of your country, but you still feel about your country, have an emotional attachment, and contribute, and keep link, you are a diaspora. Diaspora is certainly an asset in every sense of the word. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I I'm, I'm really appreciate that very, very positive description of the role of a diaspora, we can come back and uh, discuss some of that later. So, Raja, you have five minutes too. I'm glad that Shahid was very disciplined about his five minutes. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Thank you. Yeah, let me just supplement the uh, fabulous presentation by the Foreign Secretary. Uh, there is a Kishore Mehbubani rule, I don't know how many of you know. It says, uh, never make more than three points. So I'll just make uh, three, bring in three points to supplement what uh, the Foreign Secretary said. First, I think there is a history to the fact that why does South Asia have such a large diaspora? Uh, 50 million is the one number that we heard this morning, uh, assuming that includes both the people of South Asian descent as well as the non-resident South Asians who are living in other countries. So there is this uh, large body, 51 million people, uh, numbers, of course, many countries still don't maintain effective records, but it's a large number. Uh, to understand this large number, I think we've got to go back to the empire, that the extraordinary movement that took place under the British Empire, uh, people from India were moved, some deliberately, some coercion, that the Indian labor moved across the board. Uh, if you see on a map, uh, from Fiji in the east, to Suriname in the west, to Mauritius in the middle, the emergence of sugar cultivation, the building of you know, the labor that was needed for the imperial business enterprises, so provided a basis for, and the India had, sorry, the undivided India had a surplus population, uh, readily available labor that moved across the board. Uh, before you think it was just labor, Indian capital also moved. In fact, one of the untold stories is how under the empire, 
the capital from India, uh, Kishore is here. I mean, I think the Sindhi, Gujarati capital that spread across the world under the protection of the empire. So both capital and labor, and because of the empire allowed free movement, there was a huge movement of these people, and it left a legacy of both capital and labor uh, across the world. Some of it would, of course, later uh, create problems. A second wave of migration, really, of movement of people, uh, more what we call you know, non-resident in South Asians, uh, post-60s, uh, actually, as the Western countries opened their borders, starting with the Anglo-Saxon world, where they saw the need for having foreign labor, the opening up of the labor markets in the West, the US opened its borders to Asians in 1960, uh, and UK uh, equally, and it was really the South Asians who benefited the most, who migrated the most, who moved with the, the skilled people that began to move. So I think these were the two waves in which people moved across, and today that is the body that constitutes the 50 odd million uh, that's available today. A uh, second point uh, is, is how do we think about it? There are problems, as you know, since uh, uh, the Foreign Secretary highlighted the uh, positive side, I just want to uh, mention the problems uh, at least two, three problems come straight away. Now, when you have such a large body of people outside, uh, when they get into trouble, there is a lot of demand that you protect them. There was a period in India, for example, you went out, you went on your own risk, you were a refugee, God take care of you. But today, if three nuns from Kerala go missing in Iraq, the chief minister of Kerala is calling the central government, what the hell are you doing for my three Kerala nuns who are sitting somewhere in Iraq? and the government of India has to respond. So I think today governments in South Asia are under pressure to respond to the securing the interests of the people, particularly in crisis situation. And if you see the last 15 years, the dramatic expansion of uh, evacuation operations, starting from the Iraq crisis in 1990, today India spends a lot of money, a lot of, you know, military is frequently deployed to move people to safety back to the homeland and give them protection of all kinds. So that is one problem. Second, we, we know that the diaspora is a bridge to bring good ideas uh, from the rest of the world, best practices, tell a largely insular subcontinent there is a different way of doing things. But then the diaspora also brings problems. Uh, the Gulf, for example, we, in the second wave of migration, the emergence of the Gulf economy saw a huge movement of people. So do people who go to Gulf, do they come back with different ideologies? Uh, that's been a big issue, and those of you saw the Sri Lanka bombing recently, I mean, this whole question of the influence of outsiders. I mean, I think it varies from place to place. But the fact is, ideas are not, you know, you can't say, look, I'll only let good ideas come in and bad ideas not. So I think there is an integration brings with it uh, a set of problems, uh, managing which uh, has become very, very difficult. And the third level is, uh, what is the relationship between the host government and its people living abroad? Now, it's found it convenient to mobilize these people for specific political purposes. Uh, India has done it in the U.S. very well, and recently Imran Khan's visit uh, to U.S. Uh, saw uh, extraordinary mobilization of the Pakistani diaspora, almost just like what the Indians did. And of course, sometimes we carry our quarrels abroad, so there is that problem as well. But I think the important thing was, having mobilized people, uh, how do you keep the distance? Because go going back to Bandung, both Nehru and Chavan Lai assured Southeast Asia and the rest of the world our people living in these borders are your people, they're your citizens, we have no political claim for them. But I don't know the argument today about China, how China treats its foreign uh, people of Chinese origin, what is the relationship between the state, how does it play in the domestic politics, intervention, non-intervention, a whole range of new issues are coming, and, and I think that's a problem. And the third issue relating to this is the returnees. The open borders are closing, as the Foreign Secretary said in Europe, 2015 was a decisive moment. A Gulf boom, if it comes to an end, a lot of people are going to come back. Are we prepared to cope with the returnees if the rest of the world is not as welcoming as it was, not, as it was in the last uh, 50 years? So I think that's a whole new situation. To the final point, a, a theme about diaspora that we don't talk about it is diaspora within South Asia. Uh, the partition left people of different communities in different places, and I think it's still, a, and, and that is one part. Then uh, people have moved to work, Nepalese, for example. In India, there are Indian Nepalese, Nepali Nepalese, and maybe you can think of other categories. Uh, what rights do they enjoy? How do we 
protect them, how do we deal with them, uh, remains an issue. I'm not going into the other issues. I don't want to create too many controversies. But I think it's something that South Asia, which was enjoyed the welcome of the rest of the world for its people, within their own borders, I don't know if they've been good enough, and that they need to come to terms of how do you facilitate better movement of people across their own borders, the diasporas that are distributed within these countries, and that we need a more wiser policies that will seek to help the movement of people uh, in and out uh, for our own benefit, because the benefits we've got, we should be able to uh, give it to our own people who are moving within the subcontinent, within the new borders that were created post-1947. Thank you. Wow, both our speakers have brought up an extraordinary range of uh, important issues. And also, you made me aware, by the way, Raja, I was trying to figure out why am I chairing a, a forum on the diaspora. You reminded me I'm a Cindy. <laughs> and actually, my father was a, clearly a, a member of the diaspora. He came to Singapore at the age of 13 uh, to work as a peon in 1933 at five cents a day. So he started off very well. <laughs> And then, uh, uh, amazingly enough, uh, even now, today, I have first cousins in uh, Mumbai, Calcutta, Nigeria, Ghana, London, New York, um, Texas, Suriname, Guyana, Tokyo, and Hong Kong. <laughs> first cousins. <laughs> That's the Sindhi diaspora for you. <laughs> so, uh, I guess in that sense, I, 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 I guess I personally experienced the, the diaspora experience in a very uh, direct way. But I have, you know, since the, the question, the fundamental question being asked here is, are they an asset? Uh, and, and clearly we can have a, you can quantify the economic stuff, because clearly remittances and all that, you can quantify, you can say, talk about the benefits, and so on and so forth. But I wonder, you know, talking of assets, huh? and I'm, I'm going to build on a point, Raja, you made, when you talked about the, uh, the diaspora within South Asia or so. I wonder whether the South Asian diaspora outside South Asia can help to bridge the political differences within South Asia. And I, and, I, and I say that quite seriously because I lived for 10 years in New York. And one of the funniest things about New York, New York as you know, is full of South Asian diaspora. The Indians and the Pakistanis got along very well in New York. <laughs> they ate the same food, they enjoyed the same music, you know. They went to the same restaurants, they, they had a great time, they also used to work for the same city bank, you know. So Indians and Pakistanis uh, had difficulty getting along in South Asia, but they had no difficulty getting along in New York. So I wonder whether or not, and both of you, you know, and, and from your, as you know, from your point, of, you, I'm sure you know that uh, people from Bangladesh overseas also uh, network very well with the fellow South Asians. And, and when you're overseas, actually you see you're one people rather than many different people. And that comes out clearly when you're in the diaspora. So I was going to ask you, maybe Raja first, and then you, Shahidul. What do you think? I mean, can, can the diaspora help to heal some of the political divisions uh, within South Asia? I don't know if they can, but I think we should give it a shot. That I think what we've seen happen in the last 15 odd years, 20 years, certainly, there's now a competitive mobilization of diaspora by all the countries in the region. So some extent that the India Park thing translates, and we've seen some of that in London last few days after Kashmir and, and in the US. But, but there is also the potential, I think, where the diaspora, as you said, a lot of things bind them, uh, the South Asian identity as a collective beyond the national identity. Uh, I think we've not made an attempt at that, but I would think there are possibilities there that we begin to, and one of the reasons why we do this South Asia Diaspora Convention mm -hmm. is really to, to un underline or highlight what is shared, what is common between people uh, in, among the South Asian diaspora, that if they can work together in Silicon Valley uh, and in somewhere else, I mean, that we can also do the same. So I think, but it's an idea, it's an ideal, but I think we should, which is uh, getting difficult, but I think we need to try that. Second is the subnational transboundary identities. So there are Bengalis, since we have a Bengali on the podium, there are Bengalis in India and Pakistan and abroad. There are Punjabis in India, Pakistan, and beyond. And both, mind you, these are the Bengal and Punjab were the largest spaces in India, the two regions that actually got partitioned. Uh, their global footprint is fairly significant, the two communities. So I would think there is room there for the, for the Bengalis, for Punjabis, to say, look, we have interests that are common, and that can we do that? Well, it's very heretical for the nation states, 
But the fact is, like you saw in the Kartarpur corridor recently that got opened, within all the gloom and doom of India-Pakistan, uh, whatever the reasons for it is that Pakistan opened what was a highly securitized border for the Indians, uh, Sikh pilgrims from around the world, to go across, walk across the border to visit the shrine. So I think, I think there are possibilities that, like there is a World Punjabi Conference, for example, which has been talking about, been occasionally we've tried to do some themes about Punjab-Punjab cooperation. So I think if you think of South Asia as a region, South Asia of multiple communities, there's room there for us to exploit. Hopefully, the SADC or ISAS can take up this project of how the communities of South Asia, because they're not just Indians and Pakistanis or Bangladeshis, they've actually a global citizens do have a huge weight and impact on the rest of the world. Thank you. What, 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 from, what, what do you see this as prospects uh, of the diaspora overcoming the I, political I divisions? I, I, I tend to agree with uh, Professor Raja Mohan on that, that, um, that uh, outside South Asia, the South Asians could be uh, the best friend of each other. But I would like to broaden uh, the, the geographical area. And before that, you know, just to share with you, as, as uh, Professor Rajamohan has been saying, Bengali diaspora, currently uh, I'm, I'm writing a book on the Bengali diaspora and doing a little bit of a research uh, with, with, uh, with another person. And we realized that uh, Bengalis were, uh, from the Bay of Bengal region, uh, actually Bengalis were one of the pioneers to go to England. And, and, the, and the date that we could pick up is uh, 1619. Wow, 1619, a group of people so we are celebrating along with the, the British four, state. 400th anniversary this year. Yeah, six, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, couple of Bengalis decided that uh, they will go with the Britishers as their Lashkars and, 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 and Babuchis and all kinds of things. And then they subsequently decided to stay back and, and got married and, and there are stories of it. And subsequently, over the years, we, we see uh, that from Indian subcontinent, people went uh, all the way to America and to Australia and to Canada and other places. Sometimes as soldiers, sometimes as sailors, sometimes as uh, as Lashkars. Uh, so that's uh, that's something very intriguing, and 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 we also intend to uh, uh, sort of chase out as to what happened to that stream of uh, of diaspora. Where are they now? Where are their generation? Have they? How much they still feel closer to uh, South Asia? Now, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, South Asia uh, as an asset abroad. I think uh, what has happened over the years, uh, we, we now realize that the, uh, whatever you call the center of uh, geopolitical gravity or economic uh, uh, and geopolitics is moving towards Asia. Asians are also gradually feeling that they are one and another. You know, when we see them in America and other places, the Asian identity coming more and more forefront. Uh, so that is something uh, uh, is much more uh, interesting than South Asians. Uh, and I think we, we need to build that, uh, that platform, that Asians abroad as diaspora, number one. Number two, I, I'll, I'll finish with one minute. The other one is uh, we are also, we know that Bengalis are uh, culturally very close. Uh, whatever has happened has happened. Uh, and we know that uh, where we are uh, outside, uh, we, uh, they are Bengali communities, they often forget which country they come from, and they get together as a Bengali diaspora. Mm -hmm. So that's a very indicative of, of a particular race. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And I, I wonder, do, 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 is Amartya Sen seen to be a, a son of Bangladesh also? <laughs> Sorry? Amartya Sen. Amartya Sen, yeah. But there are others also. <laughs> yeah. okay. okay, now we have 10 minutes. Uh, why don't I just take three questions in a row? Uh, please, one here, two, I see the ladies are speaking great. Uh, can you, is, is, is that a mic or, or, or you just... Uh, the microphone is, is coming, yeah. Uh, would you mind identifying yourself? You know, the, with the light, we can't see you completely. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. It's a wonderful panel. I am from, I'm Rashida Choudhury from Bangladesh. Mm, oh, wonderful. And thank you so much for this interesting, wonderful panel. Uh, talking about the diaspora, the region I come from in Bangladesh, Silhet, it has a huge diaspora all over the world. Uh, but what we have been facing these days, because uh, we are part of this global Silhet diaspora, and I've been associated with that, 
We have been trying to organize big festivals, 17 in New York, 18 in Toronto, now in Calcutta this year. But what we have been discovering, all these diaspora people, as Mr. Shahidul Haq has said, that they migrated long back. Now second and third generation living there. But we are facing difficulties in making them aware of their, not only their heritage, they are proud of their heritage, but simply asking us, why and how should I contribute? They don't know how to link with each other. So when I was listening to this young panel last, it, it would be interesting to link them through maybe this Institute of uh, you know, South Asian Studies, to link them all this new generation diaspora from South Asia living all over the world. How do we do it? That mechanism should be explored, I suppose, because this new generation would love to be linked yeah. to these kind of experiences and lessons. And people like their, like their PR groups, mm. you see? So this is important for us because they don't know how to link up. We know but they don't know, and this is how we could organize. Mm. Maybe this is one contribution that ISAS sure. should do. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll take two more questions. The lady, uh, two seats away, yeah, please. Uh, my name is Aisha Khan, and I'm from Pakistan, and my questions are both for the Foreign Secretary and Professor Raja Mohan. Um, both of you have explained the uh, reasons for the two waves of migration that have created the South Asian diaspora in such large numbers abroad. So let's kind of break this diaspora in three categories, um, economic, social, and political. And I'm just going to share some thoughts with you, and I would like to hear your comments on this. Uh, when a large body of people moves to another country, Yes, economically, they may be sending remittances back home, but actually their talent is being used by the host country. So we have, you know, strategically lost that asset. Uh, Increasingly, we see that a leadership is becoming more populist and exclusive in its thinking. So the social integration that you were talking about, it's actually getting polarized outside within the diaspora in South Asia. Politically, we see that it's becoming more competitive. Each country is trying to use its diaspora for its own political dividends. So how do you think that you know this is going to be a strategic asset for South Asia when the diaspora outside is now also socially and politically getting divided, more so than we noticed about 20, 25 years ago? Thank you. Good. Two good questions. Okay, gentleman over there, please. Can you pass the microphone to him? Then we'll come back to the panel here. Hi, my name is Siddharth Jain. I'm uh, from India. So uh, I have a follow-on question. Are you, are you a uh, member of the diaspora or are you? <laughs> member of the diaspora. <laughs> I think <laughs> migrant, perhaps. <laughs> uh, often uh, diasporas comes to, like, you know, they come to the host country uh, for opportunity. Um, and therefore, they often have uh, some significant amount of money that might, they might be remitting to, uh, to their country of origin, um, and they can also have strong political opinions. And now uh, governments have started kind of going for, like in India, uh, Modi road, uh, a wave of popular NRI uh, vote, you know. So do, do they have a disproportionate uh, influence in the politics of the country of their origin? That is my question, just. Mm, thank you. Okay, I think maybe I'll start with you first. Uh, since uh, the first question was from uh, the lady from Bangladesh, Russia, the and, and then we'll go through the question uh, from the lady uh, in Pakistan, and then the. Yeah. It's good, it's good. We have a very good, diverse crowd Bangladesh, Pakistan. Presented you about diaspora, <laughs> South Asian diaspora. Um, uh, I, I will start off with the first question. I think, uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, contributions, uh, there is a strong realization that we have somehow or other left the diaspora out of our development experience and, and politics. Um, and I think all the government of South Asia, in fact, the, even uh, if you uh, include the, uh, the, the Asians, all the countries are trying and 
creating a more conducive environment for the diaspora to be able to play a, a, a good role, a, a positive role uh, in their uh, uh, origin uh, countries. So uh, there, are, there are a lot of examples, very good, also in Latin America, in Africa, uh, even in the Middle East now, uh, they, are, they are trying and getting their younger lords come back and contribute to the Middle East rather than being in America or, or, or in Europe. So that's, that's there. But what is the biggest obstacle that the diaspora face? The big, biggest obstacle is acceptability in the society. When they come back after staying, say, 20, 25, 15 years, they somehow or other do not have uh, the, uh, uh, the feel of the ground. And they grow up in, in, a, in, a, in an environment which often is different uh, than their home countries. And they come with a lot of emotions, a lot of expectations, and, and, and they get quickly disappointed. So there actually, uh, there's a big role, uh, both for the uh, civil society, uh, the private sector, and the government to make their life a little comfortable uh, when they come back. And the other one, and I was, I was very interesting to look at the what diaspora, and there's a, there's a circle uh, in the Pura. And the circle is very significant. I don't know whoever it is designed it must have something important in the back of his mind, is that, you know, it's, it's, it's not that you go, stay, uh, and come back forever. You continue to roll around. And 10 years back, I was, I was sitting in, uh, in Tehran airport. I'll, I'll give you an example, and it will show you that how the diaspora psychology works. A and I asked someone, and he was reading a Bengali book. So I, I immediately thought either he's from Bangladesh or from, from, uh, from Bengal, Pushimangla. Push so I asked him that, uh, you know, where are you from? And he said, what do you mean? I said, when, you know, you're reading a Bengali book, so. He said, look, uh, I, and he's very young, I think 25, 27. He said, I was uh, born in America, uh, then I moved to Canada. Uh, currently, I'm holding a Hong Kong passport, and uh, my forefathers were from Bengal. And then, you know, I was ashamed. I just couldn't make it out that what is his identity and what he's trying to say. So he said, we are uh, multicultural, multi-ethnic, and multi-state uh, um, citizens. We don't belong anywhere. So that's a group of uh, diaspora evolving. They don't belong anywhere. They will go and get their roots settled wherever they feel comfortable. So that comfortableness is very uh, important. Talk about doctors and engineers. Often the diaspora doctors and engineers come with all good intention, but have so much of a difficulties in, in even helping out in, in terms of charity that after a few months and years they leave. So that's where we have to really work strongly. On the issue of um, uh, uh, divide, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, it, it's part of politics, uh, part of South Asian politics, not uh, unique to any particular country. Uh, and we do, uh, you know, uh, do uh, uh, use them uh, in, in, may, in many ways. Uh, but also, I think the younger generation, I, I see that they're getting over with it. They realize that they cannot be a party uh, uh, to a petty politics uh, of the country uh, like their uh, forefathers, because they don't have an association. They don't know anyone. They only have an intention to make a difference to the country where their forefathers came from pure and simple. And as I say, they keep on uh, circling. Uh, I, I know uh, Bangladeshi diaspora went to India, went to Sri Lanka, did some charity, went back, came back after five years. So those kinds of things that uh, uh, I'm doing, but it's extremely uh, pathetic to see that often they are politicized and used for politic, pity political purposes. Politics is not always bad. On the issue of a uh, I think you did touch on the brain drain issue. I think this was an issue of 50s and 60s. The brain drain issue, 60s and 17 became an extremely lethal uh, uh, argument in terms of uh, hurting diaspora and migration debate, but we did settle that forever. The argument was that if you cannot use your brain, don't put it in the drain. Put it somewhere else, because you can then afterward use it. There are countries in Africa actually was misled by some of our international organizations' prescriptions that they didn't let their uh, uh, brain go out and, and, and create uh, more innovations uh, and, then, and then come back. But the countries which have let their 
uh, younger colleagues go, now they are coming back. Best example is India and, and, and China and Malaysia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, look, Sri Lanka. Look at them, though. Those countries have more liberal policies to letting their uh, young kids go uh, and do something better and come back later without any, uh, no objection certificate. Eh? That was the deadly uh, paper that I still remember. No objection certificate and you never get no objection certificate. That was absolutely uh, misguided. Uh, uh, and that's where we have to, we shouldn't go back to that again. You know, the, the talent should be able to move globally and that's why the World Economic Forum has taken up very strongly for the last three, four years where I, I, I represent that uh, platform, uh, setting the agendas. And they have really every year focusing on the talent mobility. And they're saying that the, one of the third risk that global business can face is from uh, obstruction of talent to move around. So that, that's, the, uh, uh, that's my uh, uh, response to a very interesting uh, question from the floor. Thank you. Do you want to touch on the last question yeah. about Modi and what he's doing? The, the disproportionate <laughs> influence, I mean, look, I think given the size of the diaspora and the relative incomes, which are much higher, as makes them a very interesting, you know, weighty proposition in the domestic dynamics in each of the countries. Uh, for example, I mean, Bollywood changed in the 90s by catering to stories of diaspora. Uh, Shah Rukh Khan maybe comes from London, you know, so all that stuff. So actually, films are released simultaneously in India and in New York and London now, because there is a global audience uh, which which is so it generates a bigger market value for the for the Bollywood uh, industry. Uh, on the political side, every provincial leader in India today reaches out to the diaspora to collect cash. Somebody was talking about crowdsourcing in the previous panel. Crowdsourcing from the diaspora is not just Modi. Nitish Kumar has done it, uh, you know, everyone is, you know, Mamta Banerjee does it. Whoever, there are in, enough diasporas, large ones, so people tap into them. So I think that's part of life now. So there is a global footprint of the South Asians. So how the dynamic affects the politics is a new factor, it's a weighty factor, it's going to be with us for a long time. I think I wanted to say something on the, on the facilities. We are blessed with facility in our midst, uh, Dr. Chaudhary, is a big champion of Silet. Uh, so we are actually, as far as ISAS is concerned, we already have a Silet uh, in our middle, and he has been educating us about the importance of Silet. But I believe over the longer term, I mean, uh, you guys have the numbers. It's, look, today there's a huge effort globally being made to salvage languages which are dying out, communities which are disappearing. Uh, at least Silet, I mean, even within the Bengali, uh, uh, you know, as, as a faction of it, it's still a large number, so today's social media, a whole lot of facilities offer. But I think it opens actually for our colleagues in the university who actually do full-time diaspora studies to look at some of these sub-communities and to see how we can bring them together, uh, how we can look at their experiences. I think it is entirely possible, and I think we can even think of uh, working together on that. And finally, to what Aisha was saying, look, there is the fragmentation, there is the competitive mobilization, as I mentioned. But I said, I mean, the example of World Punjabi Conference has actually given you a counter example of actually being, bringing the communities together. And in fact, they were very close to success in 2000s when they, both the Akali government as well as the Congress government in, in Chandigarh uh, engaged in a dialogue with the West Punjab government, uh, initially with the Chaudhary brothers and later with Shab Sharif brothers. So you have shown it actually, they've been a, a positive force to change the agenda between India and Pakistan. So I think there is room. Uh, and thanks to the subcontinent's multiple identities, we are Indians, we're also, I'm an Andhra, I'm a, you know, I got a whole lot of other identities. So that actually helps to cut through the divisive ones. Can we find some uniting identities that actually can help solve some of our problems? Well, I'm sure you all agree that even though our, our panel was one of the shortest one, we probably covered more ground than many other panels did. And we also gave an answer. As you know, the, behind me, there's a question, a strategic asset question mark. So the answer is very simple. It's yes. <laughs> the, there's absolutely no doubt that the diaspora, including the South Asian diaspora, is a major asset both to the sending countries and the recipient countries. And you've seen that despite the complexity of the issue and despite the sort of many layers in the subject, 
at the end of the day, if you look at the record of what the diaspora has done, both for the receiving countries and the sending countries, the overall track record is remarkably positive. So I'm sure you'll agree that this, our two distinguished panelists deserve a very big round of applause. Thank you very much, Raja. Thank you very much, Shahidu.